Hi, my name is Becca and I work in the Teens Department at the Main Library. To start today's video, I'm going to be reading you the first few pages of The Downstairs Girl by Stacey Lee. If you like what you hear, don't forget to check it out. Being nice is like leaving your door wide open. Eventually, someone's going to mosey in and steal your best hat. Me, I have only one hat, and it is uglier than a smashed crow, so if someone stole it, the joke would be on their head, literally. Still, boundaries must be set, especially boundaries over one's worth. Today, I will demand a raise. You're making that pavement twitchy the way you're staring at it. Robbie Withers shines his smile on me. Ever since the traveling dentist who pulled Robbie's rotting molar told him he would lose more if he didn't scrub his teeth regularly, he has brushed twice daily, and he expects me to do it too. Pavement is underappreciated for all it does to smooth the way, I tell his laughing eyes, which are brown like eagle's feathers, same as his skin. We should be more grateful. Robbie gestures grandly at the ground. Pavement, we're much obliged, despite all the patty cakes we dump on you. He pulls me away from a pile of manure. It was Robbie's mother who nursed me when I was a baby, God rest her soul. And it was she who told old Jin about the secret basement under the print shop. Whitehall Street, the spine of Atlanta, rises well above the treetops with their stately brick and imposing stone buildings, along with the occasional Victorian house that refuses to give up her seat at the table. Business is good here, and like the long-leaf pine forest being burned by Sherman's troops a quarter century ago only made the city grow back stronger. You look different today. I pretend to appraise him from his cap to his tan trousers. You forget something? It is rare to see him without the mule and cart he uses as a delivery man for Bucksbaum's department store. They're down a clerk, Mr. Bucksbaum's letting me fill in until they find someone new. He straightens his pinstripe jacket, though it's already straight enough to measure with. You don't say. Mr. Bucksbaum is popular among whites and colored alike, but hiring a colored clerk isn't done in these parts. If I do a good job, maybe he'll let me fill in on a more permanent basis. He gives me a tight smile. If you don't stick your foot out, you'll never advance. You'd be perfect for the job. I myself am fixing to ask Mrs. English for a raise. He whistles, a short, low sound. If Mrs. English had any sense, she'd give it to you. Of course, common sense was never very common in these parts. I nod, a surge of righteous blood flooding my veins. Two years I have worked as a milliner's assistant at the same wage of 50 cents a day. Measly. It is already 1890. Plus, old Jin has lost too much weight and I need to buy him medicine. Not a booty ball or a buckeye powder, but something legitimate. And legitimate cost money. Hi, my name is Aisha and I work in the teens department at the main library. Today I'm going to be reading the first few pages of You Should See Me in a Crown by Leah Johnson. If you like what you hear, I hope you check it out. I'm clutching my tray with both hands hoping that Beyonce grants me the strength to make it to my usual lunch table without any incidents. I shudder at the thought of a slip that douses me in ranch dressing, or a trip that lands me in the lap of one of the guys from the wrestling team, or worse, a video of that fall blowing up on Campbell Confidential, the gossipy Twitter-esque app some senior created a few years ago that has become my worst nightmare. I'm grateful that in a few months all this will be behind me. I'll be on my way to Pennington, the best private college in the state, living the life I've always dreamed about, one surrounded by people like me in a place I fit, on track to becoming a doctor. It's so close I can taste it. All I need is the email confirming that I got the scholarship and, lady, watch it. I've got a thing to do. Derek Lawson leans into the word thing like what he's prepping for is some big mystery as he plants himself directly in front of me. I take a step back, tray still in my death grip, and brace myself. I know what happens next. We all do. This type of public spectacle is second nature in Campbell this time of year. Before I have a chance to spare myself the very specific torture that accompanies watching a flash mob full of varsity athletes singing and dancing in unison like some sort of value brand boy band, it's already happening. Derek slides across the floor with the type of drama that would make the cast of Hamilton sit up and take notes. He climbs into the long table where his crew normally sits and points out to his girlfriend, 
of a not-so-secret rival, Rachel Collins. Someone presses play on a speaker somewhere, and that's when it starts another freaking promposal. To end today's video, I'm going to be reading you a passage from the beginning of The Loop by Ben Oliver. As always, if you like what you hear, don't forget to check it out. In The Loop, this is the closest thing we get to a shower, a government-approved waterboarding. Soon, it will be time for the rain. Every night, despite the pain of the energy harvest, I force myself to stay awake and watch the rain. It comes at midnight, half an hour after harvest ends, and it falls like a monsoon for 30 minutes. Happy, talk to me, I manage through gasps. The screen on my wall comes to life. Yes, inmate 970-981, the screen says. The female voice is calm, almost comforting. Vitals, I command. Heart rate 201 and falling. Blood pressure 140 over 90. Temperature 98.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Respiration rate 41. Okay, okay, I interrupt. Thanks. I push myself to my feet, legs shaking and muscles straining against this simple action. I scan my cell. The familiarity helps settle my breathing. Same four gray walls, bare apart from a 10 inch thick door in one, a screen in another, and a tiny window in the back wall. My single bed with its thin cover and thin pillow, the stainless steel toilet in the corner and sink beside it, not much else apart from my stack of books and a table that's welded to the floor. I feel as if I haven't recovered at all when I look at the dimmed screen on the wall and see that it's five seconds to midnight. So, exhausted, I force my legs to move and take trembling, shuffling steps to the back of the room. I focus my attention through the small rectangular window and up to the sky. I'm still breathing so heavily I have to step back from the glass so that it won't fog up and obscure my view. Hundreds of small explosions flash across the black night air. I can't hear them because my room is soundproof, but I remember what they used to sound like when I was a child, and I can almost hear that ripping echo. Dark clouds plume out from the after image of the bursts and join together, forming a shadowy sheet across the sky. The rain comes down so hard that the first drops bounce off the concrete of the yard. Deep puddles form in seconds and the smell hits me. Not a real smell, but again, I remember the way it used to smell when I was young. A fresh, pure scent that, if I close my eyes, I'm sure I can sense in my nostrils, and every time I think of it, I wish I could go out there and feel the wetness on my skin, but I can't. The rainfall signifies a new day, the 2nd of June, my 16th birthday. I've been here for over two years. This is the start of my 737th day in the loop. Happy birthday, I whisper. Happy birthday, inmate 970-981, the screen replies. 